quick survey. Uh, Dennis just came back from America. Welcome back, by the way. Tour de America. Uh, and uh, so we'll review it a little bit as we've been looking at uh, in the class. Are you watching on YouTube? I know you watch the YouTube thing, so I'm okay. But uh, we've been doing a series. What's it called? Replicate, right? And what it is basically is uh, our looking at for the future as Michelle and I do church planning and what we see scripture showing on stages of church growth and being um, a church that produces more churches um, as an organic body. Um, what are those stages as we build up the body of Christ? We looked at, um, we're looking at these seven stages basically. Um, so the first, you remember the first one? Uh huh. Prep the soil, right? And before we go in, we uh, before we go in and plant a congregation or plant anything, um, that ground, that area is spiritually prepared. We call on the Lord of Harvest to prepare an area ahead of us, right? And um, we see this time and time again in scriptures. Then next, what happens? After we have the soil prepared, we plant the seed, right? And um, once the ground is ready, just like in in uh, our normal life, once uh, you get the nutrients in the ground, you can then go out and plant the seeds. So they grow up, we begin watering them, we nurture them, and then third, what starts to happen? Mm -hmm. The roots begin to grow. So, um, so we spiritually pray over the area. We start planting seeds, we go out, we're planting gospel in the neighborhood. And we're telling that message of life, love, and liberation. It sinks into people's lives. We talk about growing deep roots. Um, first of all, into God's word. In order to be a body of Christ growing up strong, we need to, be dug, we need to dig deep in the message of God. Um, in order for us to be a congregation um, that's relevant, that's in our communities, we need to be digging deeper into our communities as well as we talk, talk about, right? As we engage in people's lives. We learn about social issues going on, right? We begin to connect with our neighbors, um, with local leaders, other things, as the church begins to form. We talk about connecting with the people of peace um, in this stage as well. So once deep roots begin to grow, uh, us as a body, we start to take more form, right? Like a tree, it begins to sprout up and forth. Do you remember what's going to happen? Strong branches. strong branches, right? In order to be a strong living tree, Um, we need to have strong branches develop. That's what we're going to look at today. Uh, these are branches of ministry and leadership um, as the church, as we reach out, um, as we reach out as a church. We need to have good leadership in the body, sustainable. In order for us to be a sustainable church, it needs to be sustainable as a whole, right? Um, and always, sometimes we look at it in just a financial way, maybe, or we look at it in just in terms of, of a physical way, that they be on their own now. Um, their own area. But that also means in terms of leadership as well, right? Um, so that starts um, in growing these strong branches. You remember that after strong branches develop, what begins to happen? Yeah, fruit should develop. We know that fruit matters to Jesus because Jesus says in John chapter 15, as we produce fruit, we prove to be his disciples. That word prove, we'll look at uh, more in the future. It shows that it's in our nature as disciples to bear fruit of disciples, right? Uh, so we'll look at this more. We should be, um, as a body of Christ, producing fruit of disciples. And then sixthly, six, 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 six. yeah, the mature church, right? The mature church, at this point, we should be living out um, a full organic and why and we should be living together as a community and we'll look at what does healthy body life look like and um, we see this kind of language used throughout scripture the organic living body of Christ and then last but not least is seventh right we replicate as a church just like other living things we're producing more of our own um, that happens on every scale, right? As disciples, we make more disciples. We talk about in our missional communities, our small groups, we make more small groups, missional communities, right? And then as a whole, as congregations, we replicate, we produce more congregations, right? So um, today, I want us to look at um, 
this area of strong branches and leadership, we're going to um, start out um, looking at some language from Ephesians chapter 4. Um, so let's turn there. Um, 
the church is the body of Christ, right? We know that, that Christ Jesus, that he's the head. Um, he's the leader of the church that we're going to say. Look here in verse 13. It says, until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son, growing up into the mature man, the stature measured by Christ's fullness, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But, in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the what? Who's the what? Who is the head? That is Christ. We talked about this before, right? Um, how as we talk about the church, who's the head of the church? Jesus is. We talked about this before, right? Um, the church isn't our church. Um, sometimes we build our signs, right? Boom, 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 boom. Start some porch for Christ. We can make cool t-shirts. Um, we can claim it. it is our church to an extent, but who's the head? It's Jesus. Um, so who's in charge? It's Jesus. It's a part of his overall plan that we talked about, right? Um, we left that out. Before we look at all of this, we talked about that, that foundation. That foundation that our God is a missional God. It was his plan before time began to empower the nations through the church, right? So it's his church. He's the one in charge. He's the one head, the one leader. Um, so we all are bundled in through him. In John chapter 15, it talks about how we're connected in him. We remain in him like these branches, okay? Um, so what I, want, what I want us to look at today is these five roles of ministry that he talks about. Um, as he talks about these apostles, um, he talks about these prophets, he talks about uh, these evangelists, and these shepherds, and these teachers. He says, these are all important for the growing up and the building of the body of Christ. Um, and I want us to, we'll look at more of these later because um, of over 2,000 years uh, that we've had Christianity, language has developed some of these terms. A lot of different Christian groups have used these terms in, in wrong ways, in false ways, to the extent that, that we often don't look at the body of Christ as having representation of these roles in ministry. Um, and some, a lot has to do with misunderstanding and misteaching. Um, in America, some groups may have, you may know some groups where they say, when you go into a church, say, we have an apostle that's the head of our church. Anyone ever met a church like this? They, the apostle tells us like what to do. Um, but they think that the apostle is the head, right? But the apostle's not the head because who's the head? Christ. Jesus is, right? Sometimes we have over-dominating churches where they say, we have a one pastor, this, um, your translation might actually shepherd, or it might say pastor, the one that shepherds. They might say, we have one pastor shepherd dude, and he's the head, he tells us what to do. That's not the case, right? Because he's the head of the church. It's Christ, right? I mean, Christ is giving himself to the body um, through all of these leaders. Um, these are all important for the building up of the body of Christ in different forms and functions. Now, Jesus set aside um, some of these in a special way. We know of special roles um, in history that we'll look at later. In the Old Testament, we have special prophets that were named, right? Um, we have the prophets that foretold of Jesus coming. We saw God's plan. And we also have um, apostles that were set aside for a special class. We have apostles that are capital A apostles um, in the New Testament, right? That's the 12 apostles that Jesus set aside because they were the first ones um, to carry that message, right? The New Testament also um, refers to many outside of the 12 that are also apostles. And that's because the word apostle simply means a sent one. It is a an apostolos, someone that is sent forth, sent forward, right? Um, really, today, what we normally would say instead of apostle when we talk about them in scripture is probably just a missionary, um, because it's just easier on our minds that way. Because when we think of apostle, we normally think of a lot of theological garbage and baggage that the name carries, but. Scripturally, it's this term apostle. It is someone sent for. Um, when they're sent, they're sent for a mission, right? When you're going out, you're going out for a cause. Um, as we look at these terms, um, we want to do so in a biblical way, using biblical terminology, because it helps us to understand. Uh, language is a key 
to understand it, right? Um, we're all foreigners to the land of Thailand, and while in Thailand, we try and learn new language, right? I think that we're trying to learn. <laughs> um, and sometimes there's certain things in culture, um, there's certain things that we can't understand unless we're given language to understand it, right? Um, there's certain concepts. We just don't know it until we, we give it a name, a word. Um, once we have that word, it opens up the doorway to understanding. Um, I'll give like two examples. Um, one, one is this concept, maybe you've heard of before, the concept of Grangi. You ever heard the Thai word Grangi? Grangi? Never heard Grangi? Um, Grangi, this is an important Thai concept. Um, and it goes like deep into understanding Thai culture, but we don't have in a direct translation of this word in English. Um, so let me explain Grand Jai a little bit. We'll do, we'll do like another, we might do another one if we need to. But uh, Grand Jai, it's this idea of, uh, of ties are very, um, ties are very non-confrontational, right? Um, they're very caring people, up to the point to where if they feel like you're bothered um, by something, they're not going to like do it, right? So let's say like, um, let's say for example, like uh, I, you know, I was sitting where Nicole was sitting, like I had my books there. But then like I see Nicole comes in and sits down. And then, you know, she's sitting there and it's like, oh, you know, I should tell Nicole, like, hey, Nicole, you know, that's my seat, you kind of stole it. If I were, as an American, I would have a problem with this. You know what I mean? Like, no, Nicole, get out of my seat, go. It's a deal. <laughs> I was sitting there and my Bible and stuff. But when you go in, you know, there's sometimes there's that awkward situation of like, you want to do something, but you feel bad about it. There's that feel badness that stops you from doing something. That's this brain jive. They have a word for it in Thai, it's brain jive. And they have a word to where, to, up to the extent that if I were American, I'd be like, yo, that's my seat, you know, give it back. <laughs> but the Thais, because of brain jive, they won't do it. They won't, they won't say anything, they won't do it, they'll just smile. <laughs> they'll smile and, and move on, basically, right? So sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, you see food? You, got, you bought your own food. And everyone comes in and say, oh, you know, that fried chicken looks good, that sometimes looks so good, can I have some? And they say, you know, they smile and they say, sure, have some. They really don't want you to, but they feel bad. And because of grain jai, mm -hmm. they give it to you, right? Have you seen this? This, this makes more sense in Thai culture? Mm -hmm. You've seen this a lot, right? Um, and now that you know this word, this language, it opens up this doorway in an understanding this concept, right? And so this is true in a lot of ways. Um, we'll do one more example just for fun. Um, any foodies? I know a lot of you like to eat. Anyone consider themselves like a booty? You like love food? Um, there's a there's a food term called unami. You've never heard this this word before? Unami. So we talk about flavor profiles, you normally have sweet, salty, um, bitter, spicy, sweet, salty, bitter, spicy, and sour, right? And now uh, in the in the culinary world, they talk about this new flavor profile of Unami. Um, unami is a little tricky to understand um, from like a Western uh, worldview because we normally don't we normally don't have it represented quite fully. But it's this richness taste. For example, when you eat um, when you go to eat like Jap it's a Japanese term. When you go to eat Japanese food and you uh, you eat something like uh, miso soup. You know, miso soup it has this kind of odd richness to it, right? Um, you, there's like oh what is that? There's like the little sweetness. Um, but there's that mix from the seaweed and from that soybean where it's just like, what is this flavor, this, this odd richness that comes out? It's this unami, right? Or when you go and you get a good teriyaki steak, um, and it's seasoned just a little bit differently, right? Where it's got this, I don't know what it is, this richness that comes out. It's this unami um, flavor. Um, and in Thai food, it's represented also when we eat things like dom yum gum, um, we eat things like that, they add the fish sauce. And it brings out, you know, if you put too much fish sauce, it brings out, oh, nasty, like, sour bitterness, right? Um, but when it's bounced right, it's like, oh, wow, look at this complex, rich flavor, right? This unami. Uh, so these are, in these uh, cultures, these languages, these are key concepts to understanding what, what, was, what was the purpose? Um, what is he giving? What, are they, what is the core belief here? And in the Bible, um, when we go to the Bible, it's important to understand our original thought and our original language for that same reason. We understand the culture and what's being taught and what's being represented. So as we look at the as we look at the church, 
um, and looking at these roles, we'll look at them in more detail later on um, to understand you now what is the biblical concept behind um, these ministry and leadership profiles. Um, as Jesus talked about these, what was he showing us? Um, what was he showing us is ministries for building up the body of Christ. And this is important for us to do because when we don't when we don't lay in the correct foundation, when we don't develop um, the church um, in the proper way, it can be a dangerous thing. Um, it turns me to 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. So we know that um, the Corinthian church was a church that had um, a lot of problems with division and different things going on, and Paul's very direct with them uh, in talking about how they need to get over, they need to get over their, their little issues of, uh, of bickering, uh, of division, um, they need to get over their big sin issues as well, a lot of immorality um, going on. Uh, but he talks a lot about the body of Christ and how it's built up and the importance of it being built on the proper foundation here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, so look here as he talks about, as he begins this uh, conversation, verse 5 of chapter 3. So he says, what is Apollos and what is Paul? He says, they are servants through whom uh, you believe, and each has the role the Lord has given. He says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now, the one who plants and the one who waters are equal, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers, and you are God's field, God's building. According to God's grace that was given to me as a skilled and master builder, since I have laid a foundation and another has built on it, but each one must be careful how he builds on it. So Paul begins talking about himself and Apollos, right? As these builders, he says, I went in first. He says, I was the first one, really. I went in and I planted, I watered, I got things ready there. And Apollos came later. And both Paul and Apollos, like several others in Scripture, they are both lowercase apostles. Um, Paul, Apollos, we have um, Barnabas, um, Silas, Timothy, Titus. We see them all referred to as apostles. They're sent ones, right? They go out to prepare this spiritual foundation, to ready the soil, to begin planting these congregations, to get them ready, basically, right? Um, and as Paul talk, talks about, he says, you need to be careful as you go in, because it's important. <laughs> um, when we think about the body of Christ, um, it's not just a game, he's saying, so I went in as a skilled and master builder. You don't have that architectural background, a lot of legal business people in the room, you don't have any kind of like engineering, physical science background? Okay, that's okay. Neither do I. We'll talk about it a little bit. <laughs> we know basics, right? Um, in Thailand, when they go in to build a building, uh, what do they first have to do? Let's talk about this. When they go in to build a building on Thai soil, what do they first have to do? They dig in deep to get rid of all that clay. The clay that comes out of the Thai ground, it looks just like what we buy at Toys R Us in America. It is gooey, sticky, gray clay. You can build anything you want out of it. Um, but if you build a building right on that, it's going to sink, it's going to crumble, right? Um, so you've got to build it right, you've got to build it well. Um, they go and they build that foundation. They ready the rebar. It says, I've gone in like a skilled and master builder, and I lay the foundation. Um, in verse 10, he says, but each one must be careful how he builds on it. Verse 11, because no one can lay any foundation that other than that has been laid. And that is what? Jesus. So Jesus is that foundation. So when we go in, um, the, whole, the whole thing is all laid on that foundation that is Jesus Christ. I mean, it should be Him and that alone, right? Look here in verse 12. It says, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and costly stones, um, wood, hay, or straw. Verse 13, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, 
because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test the quality of each one's work. It talks about how as you go in, Paul uses a, a similar language in 2 Timothy. He says, as he goes in, it's all this kind of material that you can use to build, right? As um, so you go in, he says, um, later, eventually, I mean, you may not know at first what kind of foundation, how well it was built, but later when the testing of fire comes, the true work will be revealed. Look what he says. He says, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each one's work. In verse 14, if anyone's work that has been built survives, he will receive a great reward. He says, if anyone's work is burnt up, it will be lost, but he will be saved, yet it will be like an escape through fire. He says, don't you know that you are God's sanctuary, and the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone ruins God's sanctuary, God will ruin him. For God's sanctuary is holy, and that is what you are. Um, Paul is talking about really a scary kind of thing. As he's talking about um, people laying solid foundations like Paul and Apollos. And he talks about how also you need to be careful because sometimes people are laying foundations, they're building up things that are built falsely, right? Um, they went in, they should have used stone and iron and gold and silver, he says, but it's only using wood and straw, right? And what happens when fire comes to wood and straw? Boom, it's burned up, right? It's unhealthy. Um, and unfortunately, we know that this is true in the world. Um, we talked about in here already how globally, um, globally, um, churches, there's churches all over the world um, that don't last, unfortunately, right? Um, they're weak, they're dying. Um, what's going on? We often wonder. We say, why? Why does this church not last? Why does it not remain? Um, and the reality is because they're not healthy. You know, it could be that there was a, a bad foundation laid um, originally. Um, I'll get to you. I'll try and get to you in a second there. It could be that there was a bad foundation laid originally. Uh, when I was young, when I was eight, when I was 18, I just graduated from high school. I met two guys at a camp um, that said that they were preachers. Um, and I said, what? They're only, you're older than me, they're 19. And they're in college. I said, yeah, we go and we help preach. And I think they're from Oklahoma. And so our church has this thing where they send out preachers to these little congregations that are weak. And we said, so we go and we do this. I said, that's, that's funny. I said, our church, we do a thing like that. I said, my dad does it. And I said, as a youth group, we do it like once every other month or something. And said, you can do it. They heard me speak at camp. They said that you have the ability to teach. You can be going out and doing that. You can grow in it. I had never thought about this before. Um, they said, you go out, there are these little churches that I would show up to, sometimes half this size. Um, and there would be all these people, um, but no one would teach, no one would do anything. Sometimes I had to go, and I would literally, I would show up, I'm 18, 19 years old, and then I would teach, I would preach. <laughs> I'd lead singing, which I don't like doing. <laughs> so I was a music major, but I taught, you know, I directed band. <laughs> I had to do vocals. Um, but I would lead singing. And then, you know, I'd have to turn around, and then I do a little Lord's Supper, I do communion. Why? Because it was it was spiritually sick. It was dying. Sometimes the body of Christ, when it's not nurtured in the right way, man, it can be sick. It can die. Um, a lot of these churches, unfortunately, that I knew of, um, they're gone. Somewhere in these little areas, you know, where um, one, they're meeting on their own because that church in the next town died already. Um, but they can be weak, they can be sick. Boom. Um, they can burn up. They can die. Now, all this, are you talking about as from the faith of the people? Uh, the strong? Uh, the faith. The faith? Yeah, and as, as we go in, sometimes when we go in and we lay, we talk about planting churches, we talk about being a Christian, sometimes we, we make it about something else other than Jesus, right? Sometimes groups, their aim isn't Christ. Uh, maybe it's making their own name great. Maybe they want to control a group of people. Um, they're focused on one teaching uh, specifically. Um, maybe they had they taught Jesus, but they had something else. You know, that they're kind of balancing everything else on instead. Um, and it's just a toppling balance beam. So if it's not built on that solid foundation, it's not going to be healthy, right? When the testings of fire has come, it's not going to stand. Um, so it's a scary thing. Sometimes, uh, this, is, this is why we're, Paul is reminding this group of this. 
say, I want you to wake up. So we need to be aware um, you know, how healthy is your body. He says sometimes as they go in, these people, you know, they may have not done so um, intentionally. He says, look what he says here in verse 15. He says, if, anyone, if anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved, yet it will be like an escape from the fire. So it's like some of these people, they go in, and what they build was so off mark that it's just going to be completely burned up by the fires. You know, maybe they did it on accident. It says, like, they might escape, but it's going to be buried. You know, they're, like, running out the door as boom. Um, so it's this, it's this really dramatic picture here. But what Paul is getting at is that you need to realize the importance uh, of what's going on. He says, because as the church, he says, in verse 17, he says, as a church, you are God's sanctuary. You are that holy dwelling, right? And that's what we talked about more last week. It's not about the brick and mortar, right? Um, as he talks about silver and gold, he's not just talking about stone, but he's talking about you, right? He's talking about me and you. And he's saying that we need to be building on a solid foundation and we equip the saints properly. Um, so a little, a little scary of a picture, but I, but I want to point out so that we're aware um, that as we, as we function as a church, we need to be a healthy and living church. I think that sometimes we like to ignore this kind of concept, right? To look at the, as we look at churches um, that are sick and unhealthy, um, as I mentioned in the past, sometimes we look at it and we say, oh, you know, Christianity is on the decrease. We like to find all these other excuses as to what's going on. You know, say, oh, you know, um, the new millennials, they don't like to have kids as early as other people in past generations. And Michelle and I, so they're like, Christians just aren't born as fast as they used to be. Um, but do we see this as the God's plan for making disciples? We give birth to Christians? No. You know, we say, oh yeah, um, in their schools, in their neighborhoods, there's a lot of Muslims and, and gays. And as Christians, we really don't like talking to you you know, Muslims and gay people and Buddhists, it's really hard. So yeah, the church is, the church is dying. Um, a lot of times we don't want to address the true issue going on, right? Um, but we see here in Ephesians 4 that as a mature body, can be growing up um, into him. Let's go back there to Ephesians 4. says, this is important, he says, in verse 13, it says that we grow up into him who is the son, it says, and we become a mature man. As we do this, this is how we, re we reach that mature stature as a church that we get later on. He says, that's the goal, we want to be mature. Uh, he says that we will no longer be these little children, tossed by waves and blown down by every wind of teaching by human cunning and cleverness and techniques of deceit. And he says, as we do this, we're going to withstand those tests of fire, basically, that he's talking about. As false teachers come, as, as world philosophies, these different things, as the strong, mature church will be able to withstand all of it. Um, he says there in verse 15, he says, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow into him who is the head of Christ. From him, the whole body, is fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament as it promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. So what he points out is, is that we grow into him, that's our head, as we unite together in love. As who does our part? Is it a chosen view? When he says as each one does our part, basically, right? And as each one does their part, we grow into Him, that is Christ, who is the head. Um, so what I want us to look at, as we look at growing strong branches and developing, developing strong leaders, um, we, do so, we do so by empowering one another, right? We find opportunities um, for one another. We unleash the potential that is within each one of us. Um, and this happens on its own. As we look at the body, um, as we look at the body, uh, it says that Jesus, he gives these gifts. Sometimes we think about the truth, say, oh, I want to grow up. Um, we want to grow strong. Uh, we just need to pray, because it says that Jesus, he gives us what we need. 
It means that what we have is right here with us, right? Uh, sometimes we think about, oh, you know, where are we going to find a really good teacher? Oh, we have this kind of evangelist. You know, they would, they would speak in, they would neighbors, it would be so awesome. He says, they're within the church. Um, sometimes, though, we don't understand that we have that potential. Uh, sometimes we need someone to come and tell us. And when these roles are developed well, um, they can spot it within someone else. When we have a uh, healthy apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, um, teacher, they can see uh, what was what's within them in another. Just like those guys saw in me. They said, hey, <laughs> you're like me a year ago. You can do what I do. Um, sometimes we need someone to come alongside us and to say these things. Um, so what I want to do, um, what I want to do today is I'm going to give us, we're going to give us this, or I'm going to give you this. Um, it talks about these roles and these ministry profiles. I have so much garbage on here. <laughs> this is why I need the PowerPoint, right? Um, 